do the continents rift apart to create new ocean basins? What sort of models can we apply? Well, it's clearly going to involve some kind of lithospheric extension. And the question we want to ask is, are intracontinental basins like the North Sea Basin, are they the necessary precursor for continental margins formed through the rifting process? And we can explore this by considering the difference between uniform and asymmetric stretching. So let's remind ourselves about the uniform stretching model. Here it is. Continents stretch apart so that the crust and the underlying lithospheric mantle stretch by the same amount. Therefore, the synrift basin and the post-rift fill or substance basin coincide one on top of the other. The asymmetric stretching model suggests that the crust and the mantle lithosphere stretch in different places. Therefore, after the process has concluded, the thermal substance basin is offset from the synrift basin. Asymmetric stretching is inherent in the Wernicke model and in the model developed by Lister and others, which shows the idea of the mantle lithosphere stretching in a different part from the upper crust, so that if we run this model further and allow the stretching to continue and we create an asymmetric pair of continental margins, one derived from the football side of the original fault system and one from the hanging wall. So how relevant are these models to sedimentary basins? Well, this was a fundamental question in the early part of the 1980s as seismic reflection profiles began to be developed that imaged the entire crust across basin systems. And the North Sea was a key testing ground. Here's a deep seismic profile across the northern part of the North Sea Basin. We can identify the moho, we can identify the top of the crust and maybe some fault structures within it. So we can relate the basins in the shallow part of this profile to the crustal thickness across the region. A number of different attempts have been made to try and interpret these profiles. Here they come. Here's one by Hossen. Here's another example by Gibbs. Here's another example by Marsden et al. And they all show different geometries from fully linked faults in some of those earlier ones that we looked at there down to isolated faults disappearing downwards into a creeping lower crust in the Mars and et al example. So these are competing models, but is it necessary to invoke models that are more complicated than the uniform stretching model? So let's think about that as we interpret the section. So here's the moho, the mantle underneath it, the crust in pink above, and the sedimentary units on top shown in green. We're not trying to pick out faults, we're just trying to get the overall general structure of the region we can see that the Viking gravel contains a thick part of sediments that represents the post-rift basin and it overlies the thinnest crust. Therefore, this matches uniform stretching. The post-rift basin, which is charting the mantle stretching, overlies the thinnest crust, which is where the crust has stretched. So both have stretched one on top of the other. So qualitatively, it looks like the uniform stretching model is appropriate. So it appeared, as we moved into the 1990s, that uniform stretching was the state of play for intracontinental basins like the North Sea, and it seemed like the controversy was resolved. So from that standpoint, we can explain basins through the uniform stretching model, and there's no particular need to invoke more complicated models. But this was just a simple qualitative examination. What we really want to do is to do this quantitatively. So we want to um, we want to compare stretching factors through the lithosphere. We can estimate upper crustal stretching by reconstructing faults. We can evaluate whole crustal stretching by comparing the stretched thickness of the crust with that of its counterpart in the undeformed regions. And we can estimate the amount of original mantle stretching by examining the substance of the thermal substance basin that is formed in the post-rift. So these comparisons were made in a compilation by Kuznir and Karna in the noughties. We're going to compare stretching on the fault, so that's upper crustal stretch, against that of the mantle lithosphere. 
And on this diagram, the stretching factors vary from zero, that's no stretching, to one, which is infinite stretching. And we're doing that by plotting one minus one over beta, beta for the whole lithosphere and beta for the pulse. So plotting on intracontinental rifts like the North Sea, we can see that the whole lithosphere and the faults stretch the same amount. So that is compatible with the uniform stretching model. So this looks like it confirms the qualitative view that we've developed so far. But what about rifted continental margins? So let's look at a couple of margins. We'll start off here off Brazil. Here's the results of a seismic refraction profile which can get moho depth pretty accurately as we go from the continents on the left out to the ocean on the right. And we can also image the base of the sedimentary cover. What we'll do now is compare the crustal thickness versus the stretching betrayed by the top of the basement. We can assume that the original continental thickness was that at the left hand side when you get onto onshore Brazil. And we're going to do this by comparing between points A and B across the margin. Let's put back those faults. There we are. So we restored the top of the basement to more or less horizontal through there. And in doing so, we recovered a stretch on these faults of about 18 kilometers. Now on this diagram, we've conserved cross-sectional area of the continental crust. The pink is the same area on the diagram, both at the top after stretching and before stretching in the lower diagram. It's interesting because before stretching, that crust should have been the same thickness as it is on onshore Brazil. So this area between A and B should be underlain by crust that fills that rectangle. We've got a missing area of crust on here. It's not there. So there's a mismatch in this restoration. The missing part of depth implies that there's been more stretching in the crust as a whole than is represented by the top of the crust as reflected in the reconstruction of the faults. This is an example of the stretching discrepancy. It implies that the amount of stretch changes with depth. Some people coin the term depth dependent stretching for this. So let's go back to the plot created by Kuzner and Karma and use information from margins to compare with that that we've plotted already for intracontinental rifting. And here are the margins. We can see that for margins as a whole, that there's significantly more lithospheric thinning than can be accounted for by faulting in the upper crust. It implies that continental margins do not develop by uniform stretching, but by some other mechanism. It's a clear display of the extension discrepancy. Let's now go to another part of the Atlantic, offshore Galicia. And here is an interpreted seismic section through that margin, showing a series of tilt blocks down throwing towards the Atlantic on the left, towards the west, involving the upper crust. So this cross section actually encounters some rocks on the seabed over on the western side, labelled the Prudotype Ridge. This area was sampled by uh, deep sea science campaigns in the late 1970s and recognised that there was mantle on the seabed and that mantle had been exhumed from beneath continental crust. Now we could try and explain that by uniform stretching but you can see that as we stretch our ideal cartoon of different crustal levels, let's imagine the mantle is that purple material, only at infinite stretching is mantle ever exposed but even at at very high stretch factors, there's still a veneer of crust on top. So the peridotite ridge challenges the notion that uniform stretching might be applicable to continental margins. Well, the cross section we've got up there is, is slightly misleading because it's significantly vertically exaggerated. Let's, let's draw it at approximately vertical and horizontal scales equal. So that's a better representation of how crust varies in thickness as we go from Spain into the deeper part of the Atlantic. So perhaps a better explanation of this margin, rather than the uniform stretching model, is to apply the Lister et al. model of asymmetric non-uniform stretching. In this case, perhaps what we're looking at here is a lower plate margin 
where the crust is thinned a lot beneath the detachments that ripped away the upper crust and moved it eventually now to the other side of the Atlantic. Are we dealing with a lower plate margin? Whatever we're dealing with, we're dealing with highly extended continental lithosphere, a phenomenon that is now referred to as hyperextension. We have mantle on the seabed exhumed from beneath continent. So we've stretched the lithosphere so much that the crust has been pulled away. It looks like uniform lithospheric extension can explain the structure of intracratonic basins such as the North Sea, but a different model needs to be applied when we look at rifted continental margins. There's an extension discrepancy in these rifted margins. Are we dealing with different styles of continental extension? And more critically, do rifted margins really evolve from intracratonic rifts at all?